Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Can the human soul or spirit retain all its memories without having a brain? What do you do when your neighbors all belong to a weird cult that sacrifices animals? Does our experience of things paranormal change as we age? First edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. This is Rosemary Ellen Guiley sitting in for Ben this evening, and those questions came from my co-host and Ben's, Ben's dad, Paul Eno. Paul, it's great to be with you again. Oh, it's great to have you with us, and uh, uh, thank you very much for that nice intro. But uh, we're going to have a great show tonight because Rosemary is uh, going to help us with some of these questions that have come in, all of them, I guess. And uh, there's some very interesting ones as well. However, as Ben would say, uh, Donna Fantoni right here uh, in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, was the first with the correct answer to our contest question last week. In what country did a UFO supposedly fly through a railway tunnel in March? The answer, Germany. So let's get right to those emails. We, we only do a question when Ben's with us for logistic reasons, and we'll do, well, I don't know. Well, actually, what, what he's doing, he's um, finished with his semester now, and he should be back with us, but he's not, because wouldn't you know, a very important summer course that he's taking involves, you guessed it, Monday evening. So uh, we uh, have Rosemary, of course, in here very uh, kindly uh, filling in for Ben, and Rosemary is going to tell you some more about her, her work a little bit later on. Okay, so let's get to those emails. And I uh, just want to remind you, you can call us locally at 401-766-1240 or from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada, 800-449-1240. Okay, let's get right to the first one here. This, uh, this is a very interesting one. This is from Kerry in Weldon Spring, Missouri. And I'm still trying to figure out our new online form here, so forgive me if I get anything wrong. Uh, hi, Paul and Ben. I heard your show on Phantom Places, and a chill ran up my spine. A few years ago, I graduated from college and met, moved to a suburb of St. Louis to take a job. The first weekend I was there, I decided to do some exploring in some nearby woods where there were some trails. My friend came with me. After walking for about 20 minutes, we came into a beautiful field full of flowers. We walked through it and just enjoyed it, but we didn't see any other people. The next weekend, we decided to go there again, but we couldn't find it. We knew it was the same trail, but that field just wasn't there. Do you think this was a multiverse experience? Rosemary, what say you? You know, I've had other reports of similar circumstances where people encounter something, a place, uh, and it seems perfectly normal, and then they go back and they try and find it, and it has totally vanished. I even interviewed... Uh, someone a couple of years ago, this was at one of the Mothman festivals, uh, where uh, these people were out in the southwest doing a road trip, and they stopped at a, a roadside diner, and they thought it was really strange because it looked like totally retro back to the, the 50s, and they thought maybe this was just kind of the style of the place, but all the prices were like in 1950 prices. That sounds good. And they ate and left, and then they thought later, well, let's go back to that place and check it out. And you know, it was a blank spot in the road when they went back. No I kidding. People have dimensional shifts, and these might put us into a parallel dimension for a while or into another place in our own chronological timescape. Well, this particular email made, I suppose, a chill go up my spine because very much the same thing happened to me when we moved into our house here in northern Rhode Island. And this goes back 1996, 1997. And Ben was just a uh, lad, a little lad at the time. And we were out walking. And this was multiple people. It was uh, myself, it was Ben, and it was uh, my niece and nephew who were a little around his age. We also had a big black Labrador named Sam who always came with us. He sort of belonged to the whole neighborhood. That's he's quite a character. So we were walking in the woods uh, behind our house, which we had really never explored before, lots of trails. And we came upon a field of flowers, this magnificent field of yellow flowers uh, that must have been at least an acre. And there was a trail right through the center of it, a pretty wide path. And, and we walked down, and we were kind of kind of caught our breath. It was just so beautiful. And we have lived here ever since, and I have never been able to find that field again. And we're not we're talking maybe a thirty acre open space woodland area. You know, it's it's not the size of you know. Uh, Cadia National Park or something. 
So uh, I, I really, uh, really responded to this as well. And I'm thinking too, Rosemary, with with the report you uh, offered from the Southwest, we had. Um, Someone who wrote it, and as a matter of fact, they became rather prominent on the show just because of this this letter they sent. Um, I actually know they didn't. This is someone I met in Providence at a lecture some years ago, and the woman was telling me about a trip. I believe it was to Utah, and they were enthusiastic about ghost towns, not ghosts necessarily, but old ghost towns. And they had come into one that they were told was supposed to be a very interesting bunch of ruins in the place where there had been a mine or something. And they found a thriving town where everyone spoke Dutch, which they later found out was Dutch, which is not a language most people might pick up. But the the welcome to the town sign was what they later found out was in Dutch. All the cars were identical. Uh, the prices were very strange. They, they, people had sort of trouble understanding their English. And when they paid, the guy didn't want to take their paper money, but he did take coins. So this apparently is not all that uncommon. Uh, have you heard of any other stories of this kind? Uh, well, you know, Jenny Randall did a very interesting book called Time Sweeps. Yeah, Jenny Randall's uh, the English uh, author, yeah. And uh, she talked about people having these momentary experiences where you just seem to get plunked into another place that's out of sequence with your your own time. And uh, we have that famous case uh, from the early 20th century, the, the Versailles case, where the two English women went on an outing to the uh, Versailles uh, Palace grounds in France and saw people in costumes, and they thought it, they were like staff people. Sure. Uh, but they saw things on the ground that really didn't exist. And uh, this case was investigated by parapsychologists who concluded that they had had uh, an episode of retrocognition. But it's more than just seeing the past because people are really transported to a- another time. And I think that we, we have these, uh, these glitches in our chronological time. Fortunately... Um, people seem to be able to find their way back. I'm just wondering how many people might fall through time and not be able to get back. Yeah, I've often wondered the same thing. Uh, I I remember one uh, case in England. I ran into this in 89 when I was over there. Some people were telling me about jogging along a country road, and there there were five, five people. And the person who was in the lead tripped, fell, and was never seen again. He simply disappeared just before he hit the pavement. And uh, no, nothing was ever seen or heard from him again. Uh, the, the, no, the police could never find anything. Uh, they were all questioned, and it was just... Um, and I said, what's this? I said, well, I don't, don't ask me. And obviously, some sort of time slip, or as we might call it, a multiversal experience of some kind. So uh, these things occur, and one wonders what happens. Now, I, 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 that being said, there are a number of... of uh, Situations, and I'm sure Rosemary has some too, where people have appeared, or I should say disappeared from one place and been found in another. Uh, there are cases like that going way back. I know one from the, um, the 16th century, and uh, that's another possibility. So perhaps it might be spatial as well, but, but who knows. So anyway, here's, uh, here's our next uh, email. Uh, let's see, this is about an invisible friend, and it's from Marie in Yakima, Washington. Okay. Hi, guys. Love the show. I have heard you talk about invisible friends, and they seem to have all sorts of explanations. But I'm a little worried about my nephew. He has a friend called, it looks like Erdon, or Erdon. At last, that is what, at least that is what it sounds like. My sister lives in a very rural part of Washington, and this friend keeps trying to get my nephew to go into the woods. He is only five, and I am worried that Whatever this is, we'll get him to go into the woods and he will get lost. Could it try to kill him? My sister thought this was all very funny until he said it was trying to get him to go into the woods. Now she is concerned. Why is this, what is this thing and why is it trying to get him away from the house? Rosemary? Uh, there are a couple of possibilities. Children have a lot of invisible friends. The, the fairy uh, people are famous for liking children and becoming their invisible playmates. Um, the djinn also will do this. These are uh, much more of a trickster nature kind of entity. And in, in most cases, they're just playful. They want to hang out and, and uh, be with the kids. And uh, some of them are kind of fun-loving. But um, it doesn't sound good to me that this entity wants 
the child to go into the woods. Yeah, I, I agree. Be yeah, careful yeah. with that. What would you suggest they do? Um, they need to monitor the, the child and uh, pay extra close attention to him and make sure that he's not just off on his own a lot and also talk to him and tell him that it's not a good idea to go uh, into the woods with anyone, whether or not it, it's his special playmate or someone else. Yeah, and he has to say no. Mm-hmm. No, I, I certainly agree. Uh, one of the problems with these emails is, and we, we usually will resp- because we get a lot of these. We don't often have time. We don't always have time to respond. But Ben points out that we always say, "Be brief in in your um, email," but then we don't get enough information <laughs> to really answer some of the questions. So uh, that's a bit of a paradox. But here I'd say I certainly agree with you, Rosemary, on this. This is uh, a situation that needs to be uh, monitored very closely. I'd like to know more about the family. I'd like to know more about the child. Are there siblings? Uh, what is the situation? Are, is anything? And one question we always ask, is there anything else that might be called paranormal that you might think is going on? Uh, what would the explanation for that be? Are there connections? And there, there are a million questions that just come up. So what I'm going to do here is... Um, See if I can find out more. But the invisible friend thing is extremely interesting. We've had uh, Rosemary on, of course, several times about the, the gin and the fairy thing. And, of course, as Ben points out, the, the, the name fairy tends to create disbelief. But that perhaps is unjust because there, there seem to be some sort of life forms that account for this, this folklore. And we've also had Cassandra Eason from England on a number of times who was a particular expert in this and in, in children who have these experiences. I remember one time, Rosemary, when I was um, in Florida and I was uh, at, at the famous Bell, uh, Bellevue Biltmore Hotel, which is supposedly notoriously haunted, although they, they told me later they put me in the most haunted room in the place. I didn't slept like a rock. I don't know. <laughs> so the, uh, the particular staff member uh, who was involved in uh, uh, some part of the conference I was attending uh, said that she had a, a son who was, she was very worried about, had an invisible friend thing. And um, I, I conducted a, whatever a sort of an investigation uh, as best I could, and it turned out that this this was seemed to come across as a as a uh, young boy about his age, who was from a parallel America, you know. And uh, I don't know. I think after almost forty three years, I can tell the difference between baloney and something that's coming through. And in my judgment. Rightly or wrongly, this this was legitimate. So, apparently, these things can be anything. Have you heard um, of invisible friends uh, who turn out to be something you don't expect, or or, or are they always uh, you know gin or something like that? Well, in most cases, they're they're rather benign uh, because children often have these in, invisible friends. Um, sometimes they're shadowy figures. They're not really friends, but the children will see them, and, and these, like, shadow people will, will follow the children around. Um, and in some haunted cases, I've uh, heard of children having invisible playmates that suddenly become rather nasty. Yes. And uh, those, I think, are masquerading kinds of entities. Um, that's what worries me about this case with uh, the, the invisible friend uh, trying to cajole the child out into the woods. Yeah, that's fishy. Yeah. I agree with you, Paul, that uh, there's probably a lot more going on here than we know about. There's probably activity in the house. There might be a history of some sort of encounters. Mm. And there's uh, probably a lot more that we um, we would like to know. I'll see if we can find out. I remember one, one case, uh, this, this ongoing case in Connecticut, Ben and I have been sort of riding shotgun on since 05. The little boy in the house had an invisible friend whom he called Ashwar, which was an interesting name. And one evening, we were out there doing a pilot, and he was uh, saying, oh, Ashwar is in the tree. And it was fully dark by this time. It was uh, November, so it was uh, getting dark early. So we took, took some uh, infrared video of the tree, and sure enough, there was this weird thing coming down out of the tree that looked, uh, I suppose, to use a, a classic term, a kind of ectoplasmic or... I'm almost alien with, with this sort of thing unfolding like an arm. And wouldn't you know, I didn't see it when I was taking the, the shot, so I pulled away before it really defined itself. But it's very obvious, and that, that can be found at NewEnglandGhosts.com, our website. Uh, and you can check that out under, under Ghosts of New England, or I should say Connecticut. So um, anyway, uh, you never know what these things can be. And, of course, there's always the, the, the possibility that many of these are simply imagination. So that's number one that you have to consider as well. 
Okay, so let's uh, move on to another one here. Oh, this concerns um, our good friend, Murray Silver, and it's about ghosts inhabiting people. I was really anxious to get Rosemary's take on this one, too. This is from Mark in Dundalk, Maryland. I couldn't tear myself away from your recent show with Murray Silver. Now, for those of you who don't know, Murray Silver is is uh, not widely known in the field. He should be, I think. I don't know if you know him uh, either, um, Rosemary, but he is a uh, Washington insider, Hollywood insider, very much Renaissance type of fellow, and a uh, rock promoter. He worked with Paul McCartney and all this. But he's also the Savannah, Georgia area's main guy for paranormal investigations and things of this kind. And uh, this is who he, we're referring to here. Now, actually, this is going back to the email. Actually, I got in trouble when my boss caught me listening to the podcast. Oh, dear. (laughs) Sometimes I get annoyed with Murray because he always seems to go from the paranormal to politics. But the show on the possessed boy was really interesting. You and Murray did not seem to be on the same page. Do you believe that ghosts really cannot inhabit people? If so, what do you really think was wrong with the boy? I know that you have a lot of experience with exorcisms. I once heard you say that you never encountered a parasite that was a human spirit, but that you were open to the idea. If that is still true, why couldn't this possession be caused by a human parasite or remnant? As you said, anything can be possible in the multiverse. Sorry to ask so many questions. Well, that's what we're here for. So let's go back to the, I guess, the first question. Do you believe that ghosts really cannot inhabit people? Now, again, the background here is that this uh, this is a young child who was uh, abusing himself, doing all kinds of things that obviously are not normal. Uh, psychologists or psychiatrists have not been able to find any, presumably a pediatric psychiatrist, have not been able to really find anything that he could put his finger on and all this business. Uh, there were some external phenomena, and uh, the, the question of possession did arise. Now, of course, that raises other questions. What is possession? Uh, what do these things mean? Uh, one of the problems I find, Rosemary, in, in talking about this field is that our language just really isn't up to it. We have all sorts of terms, ghost, demon, possession, and, and they, we, we sort of understand, we hear them out of our own framework, which might not necessarily be the correct cosmic framework, if you follow me. So um, do, I, I personally have... N- never found a, what we call a parasitical entity, what might be classically known as a demon, that I thought was human. And I've pointed out maybe it's just because there's so little humanity left that there just isn't any characteristic of that. In my opinion, all life shares a common energy. Uh, we share I, I, even a form of identity, even with the parasites, certainly with each other. But we're all from the same fountain, as it were. And so as far as this, my interpretation looking back on on exorcism cases I was involved with, uh, and some of which I was attacked verbally in foreign languages by these things, who knew things about me that they never should have, uh, I I think these were aspects of um, the person who was being possessed, who, by the way, in my opinion, had to tacitly agree to this, no matter how down deep that feeling might have been. Um, and, and that it was also part of me in in various facets and various worlds, as we might say, and that that's how it knows these things and, and could attack it anyway. But anyway, do you, Rosemary, think have you ever encountered a situation where you believe that a ghost has inhabited someone? I'm not saying possessed, but but inhabited, because we uh, Murray had a different explanation too. What what do you think about that? Only in exceptional cases where there is an earthbound entity. Otherwise, I believe that it is a non-human entity masquerading as a ghost or being interpreted as a ghost that wants to get into the body. I have, um, in, in the course of my research of these what I call persistent negative haunting cases, um, many instances where people say they think something is trying to get into their body, and it usually happens at night where they wake up and there's a presence in the room and it jumps on the bed and they feel it uh, not just pressing down on them, but uh, they, they have the distinct um, impression that it is trying to literally get in. And these are not human beings. I think most ghosts anyway are either residues, that is, uh, they're not um, uh, an intelligent presence, uh, there's something left over, and when you have these these other presences that are aggressive toward people, 
you're dealing with something that's not human. Well, I, I, I tend to agree, although the, there are all sorts of questions. Of course, you know, in this field, every question you, you believe that you answer, there are ten other questions that arise. One is, is uh, sort of the idea that, um, I'm trying to put this, you've got a possession thing go, case kind of going on, and you have people who are walking around on the streets who are really very quite parasitical, some of them. And so mm-hmm. the question arises, you know, do, does this remain so after they, they, they die? But, of course, in our opinion, the... You you simply at least from what I've seen since I've had so many so, so much physicality that has to do with this so much material so many material characteristics to ghost phenomena in my experience that I don't think the spirit thing really quite does it and there's another question coming up that might get into that so um, I, I don't know I think that, that um, in in the possession situation you may be dealing with the, these multiversal entities as we call them that are not human. Uh, I've never encountered what it is, and I still say that I'm open-minded to the idea. Uh, but um, again, you know, th- these you know, are these lives, these life forms, the the energy, it all kind of blends together. We are really each other in very literal and concrete ways. I think Cause this is sort of a philosophy that you develop out of the paranormal, in my opinion, if you take it as far as it can go. So that does not it does not not include parasitical entities. So I think I suppose. Um, I just have to say sort of yes and no. I've never run into it. Uh, maybe you have, Rosemary, and there we go as far as this inhabita- inhabiting of people is concerned. So here's the next question. If so, what do you really think was wrong with the boy? I think we talked about that. Uh, I know that you have a lot of experience with exorcisms. I once heard da 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 Okay. If that's still true, why couldn't this possession be caused by... Hu- okay, I guess we kind of did answer all this. Uh, okay. Well, let's go. We're very efficient and economical in our answers. So I hope that uh, gives you a hand there, Mark. Uh, let us know if there's anything else. Now, this is a very interesting one, again, in a, in a different vein. It's a little bit long, but it's very interesting, so uh, so bear with us. Okay, this is from, it, the, the name just says Worried, uh, like with Dear Abby here or something, Worried, and it just says Canada. Okay. Uh, Hi, guys, I do enjoy your show, and your opinions strike me as very sensible. I am writing because I am very uncomfortable with a certain situation where I live. How are we doing on the break here? Oh, a couple of minutes. We'll, we'll do some of this anyway. I just hope you will believe me. I don't even dare tell you where I live except to say that it is in a large Canadian urban area. My husband and I moved here less than two years ago just after we got married. We have no children yet, and I think that might be a good thing because we found out after we got to know people here that most of them belong to a satanic cult. We are teachers, and all these neighbors are professional people. One is a doctor. Two are real estate agents, and two others are bankers. Well, that says a lot. And it goes on. uh, He didn't say that. I said it. And it goes on. Even some of the kids are involved. They meet in the woods, sacrifice animals, and I'm not going to say what else they do. We have been approached in a friendly way several times to consider joining them. They say that they all have good luck and successful careers because of what they worship. They never pressure us, but they now... But they know that we are aware of what they do, and it has been communicated that they would feel a lot more comfortable if we joined them. Paul and Ben, we are not especially religious, but we do believe in God, and we believe that you say what you say about this negative stuff being a dead end at best and deadly at the worst. Uh, we could move, but we love our house, and the negativity has not come in here, at least not yet. Also, the real estate market is slow. These houses are high-end, and we are, have, have been told that we might have trouble selling. But I will tell you that we have no intention of raising children here. Paul and Ben, what should we do? Uh, we're going to leave it there and take a break and give Rosemary and I a chance to consider that. We'll be right back. You're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WOON, 1240 AM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. Rosemary Ellen Guiley filling in for Ben this evening. Be right back. Hey everybody, this is the Moose Man. Check out the groove line for the best blues, rock, funk, classic 50s, and the Beatles every single week. Tune in Thursdays from 6 to 7 p.m. That's the groove line right here on ON. Well, that was quick. So here we are back with this very, very intriguing email here. Rosemary, what do you, what do you say about all this? 
I'm highly skeptical of a lot of so-called satanic cults. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure that pockets of them exist. Actually, the Church of Satan has its headquarters somewhere in Canada, but um, officially they don't worship Satan anyway. They're more of a philosophy than, than a religion. Yeah. And uh, they would probably take great exception to, uh, to these people. So my question is just really how extensive is this? Um, because if this is uh, a widespread practice, it it stretches my my credulity to think that it's going on totally ignored. Yeah, yeah, I um I do sympathize with that. Uh, I, I I tend to agree, but there's a part of me that you know I've seen things like this, and it's funny, they can be very localized. Uh, I remember one in uh, right here in Rhode Island, I remember another one in Connecticut, Central Connecticut in the Valley, where there were just localized groups, and somebody kind of got started just say, just say, for the fun of it, and uh, whether it be with, I don't know, Ouija boards or something negative like that, and, and this these things kind of take on lives of their own, but uh, how serious this is is another thing. I'm a little concerned that these uh, and again, you know, we get these emails, and we can never be sure if people are really you know, pulling our legs or what. I've never found that anyone is, uh, for the ones we've had the time to to look into. But again, you never know. But again, you know, with all due respect to those who wrote this, it comes across to me as very sincere. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah but 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 I have seen cults, localized cults that do involve highly professional people. Even politicians, and I just say that, that explains a lot. However, uh, seriously, it is, it, these things do occur. We live in very strange and paranoid times. So, um, uh, assuming this is accurate and uh, correct, then uh, I would say you really should make an effort to to get out of there if you feel uncomfortable. Now, I don't want to think it's going to be like some movie here, you know, some B movie where the cult chases the people and all this stuff. I mean, you don't want to go nuts here either. So uh, that's about all I could say right now. I would say, of course, continue to be positive. And I, I would I would give advice that I would give to any family. Stick together, even if it's just the two of you. Be positive. Do positive things. Keep the humor in there. Keep the faith in there. Whatever you're doing, and and, and uh, you know, you really cannot be overcome if you're together. So uh, that's that's about all I could I could really say on that. Uh, we'll try to find out some more. But Rosemary, what else would you add? I, I agree with you, Paul. That uh, if if the situation is as described, this is something you're not going to be able to buck. Uh, they're not going to go away. And uh, if they have conveyed that things will be easier for the family if they if they join in. That's pressure right there, and that pressure is likely to increase. Hmm. So they may have no options but to to get out, unfortunately. Yeah. It does bother me that these apparently are important people, and I kind of wish I knew where this was because, you know, I know a lot of people there. i got a lot of family in Canada, and uh, I don't know, because uh, I don't know if we'd want to get involved. I don't know, but just it, there are a lot of questions that arise from this, and uh, I would just say... Um, just wa- watch it and try to keep it positive, and I would try and get out of there if I were them. Well, all right. Here's um, back to our normal ghost question here. This is from Georgia. I never know whether to use a full name or not. Georgia H. in Austin, Texas. Okay, she apparently listens to us and has a maybe a different opinion. My, my observations on ghosts, and yes, I know the difference with demons, entities of other worlds and ghosts, the soul absolutely retains memory, whether in or out of a body, as the soul is the true being, whereas the body is merely a shell animated by the soul. Good old classic Greek philosophy. Okay. Um, now, this is why one of our initial questions was, can you not have a brain and still have all the memories and all this stuff? And, of course, you, anybody who might be uh, shoving their tongue into their cheek might say, well, there are plenty of live people running around with no brains who have memories and all this other business. However, not to be cynical. Um, I have a problem with spiritualism. Okay, now I know that that's the classic interpretation of most of this. But I just don't understand how you can have full memory, you can, how you can be your full self without your body. I just don't think the body is that unimportant. What really got me thinking on that was, and, and this, Rosemary, remember this Bridgeport poltergeist case in 74, when I was uh, physically uh, tangling with one of these entities. 
the thing had a body. I, you know, I can I can guarantee that. I even felt bone structure. And this has happened um, in one form or another to me a number of times. And, and when you hear, uh, this is my main question to to, to people who use uh, electronic voice phenomena, EVPs, people who believe they record the spirit voices. Well, if the thing's a bloody spirit, how can it talk without vocal cords? And yeah, there are electronic ways, I suppose, um, and, and things of this kind. They're all questions. Uh, why do we see ghosts doing physical things, dressed in clothes, driving cars, you know, doing all this business, if it's just the spirit? So this is apparently in response to my opinions on that, and I respect everybody's opinion. Maybe this person is right. Maybe the body just is a shell, but if it is, I don't get it. Uh, it just the whole physical world really is energy, a form of energy, and uh, in parallel worlds where laws of physics are different, you probably still have s- similar energies like that. Um, Maybe you understand this better than I do, Rosemary. What, what say you to this to this idea that you can be fully yourself without a body? I absolutely believe that. It's just a different form of energy. And uh, if there there is um, a magnetic component to consciousness, which there seems to be, sure, the body is comprised of has electricity and magnetism in it as well. And my own view has has been that for reasons that may not be apparent to us until we move on into another form of existence. This particular form is what we need to navigate in this plane of consciousness. And experiences on this plane of consciousness uh, have a purpose in the overall progression of the soul. So we all have made choices to come here, and some of us have come here many times. Um, But when we move on, uh, I, I believe that I've had incarnations in forms that I probably couldn't even conceive or recognize, and uh, that uh, we have many ways of experiencing the sum total of creation. So I, I personally, I can't get too hung up on, on uh, the physical body. It's the vehicle that my consciousness is in, in this particular incarnation, and my consciousness will carry on somewhere else. Hmm. Okay. No, I respect that, and uh, I, I know that. Um, yeah, having read books you've written, I know that that that's your opinion, and the opinion of most other people. Maybe it's it's uh, maybe I'm colored by my theological background. The um, particularly in the, the Eastern Christian mentality, which is quite different from from the Catholic and Protestant one. There's an idea that uh, the physicality of of Christ is extremely important. Which is why they chose rightly, you know, rightly or wrongly, the, 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 the gospels, the way they're written um, in the, the Bible that we have now. In other words, you've got, uh, you know, okay, Thomas didn't believe; he thought Jesus was a ghost. Well, well, I'm not a ghost. Come and put your hand right in the wounds. You know, ghost doesn't walk around with the, you know wounds you can put your hand into generally and this kind of thing. So th- there is, it goes on and on and on about the, the physical resurrection, the physical body, the salvation of the whole person, including the body. And this whole idea today of you die and your soul goes to heaven and bingo that's it or hopefully heaven uh, that, that I, I just never I just never re- I never resonated with that it doesn't you know it, it's Zoroastrianism it's not Christianity or Judaism so but so may, maybe in my opinions are colored by that but also again by by the physical experiences I've had in reference to these things again it's that but that's me you know and, and it's a minority opinion well, anyway this email goes on. Uh, uh, this is, uh, again, from Georgia in Austin, Texas. The strength of the ghost equates to the strength of mind of the individual when they are fi- were physical. Uh, and then, what would you think of that? The, run that by me again? Uh, she says, the strength of the ghost equates to the strength of mind of the individual when they were physical. That just doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense to me either. You know, um, okay, well, well, we'll leave that as it is. And uh, she goes on to describe an interesting uh, case here. There is a place in Texas, she says Centerpoint, Texas, where roughly 30 original Texas Rangers are buried. Now, Texas Rangers are uh, kind of like a, a state police force that have existed for many years, and all sorts of heroic uh, things are attributed to them. Uh, the ghosts still honor their oaths to protect the land and people there. I saw them many times and spoke to them, they liked that I could see and hear them, and they most certainly knew they were dead. They taught me a lot about the local history there and would play jokes on me and my sister when we were feeding the horses, and we'd momentarily see extra horses 
It says in linear, the fa- that must be just a misprint, in, uh, in along the fence or in line with the fence, extra horses. Uh, th- th- that's, that's fraught with peril. <laughs> Think of that. Uh, I'm wondering if they were some sort of thought forms rather than ghosts. But this has yeah. to do with my personal opinion of ghosts based on my investigations that um, most of what we call ghosts are not animated by an earthbound presence. Uh, and I do believe that there are earthbound souls, but they're earthbound temporarily. It could be for you know, years sometimes, but it's temporary. And um, in occultism, it's, uh, it's widely believed that Spirits will uh, take on the guise of human ghosts. So I'm just wondering what exactly it is that's uh, doing all of these things. Yeah, so am I. But one line here that really uh, excites my interest is they momentarily see extra horses other than what they presumably have with them. And this, to me, has multiverse written all over it, you know, blending of parallel worlds where these guys are still alive. Now, people have pointed out to me, well, that's fine, but if they know they're dead, then what's that got to do with them living in a parallel universe? If they're dead, they would, and they know it, then, you know, uh, like if you're dead and you know it, clap your hands kind of thing. So, I, but this, this might be the way we're interpreting. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's got a number of things written all over. Another thing I would mention too, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, is the idea of time. Even the word temporary has to do with time. Reincarnation implies past to future objective progression of time and physics has pretty much shown us that that if if they're interpreting it correctly does not occur which is why my interpretation personally of reincarnation is very different from others i think it's parallel lives rather than past to to future lives and i've actually talked to regression therapists about this people who hypnotize you and take you back to uh the previous lives supposedly and i've said do you ever have someone who describes a life that in, a, in an environment you don't recognize, or, or names a year that's in the future, or names a year you can't even identify, and, and almost always they'll say yes. Funny you should bring it up. And now in in regression therapy, the notion of parallel lives is being accepted because there's no other interpretation. So to me, this is more these are more arrows in the quiver of this whole multiverse idea where everything is simultaneous. So I don't know what my right, wrong, and different. What's going on here? I agree on the uh, reincarnation that we're looking at parallel lives, not past lives. Yeah, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. What's going on in, in some parallel dimension or some other part of the, the, the time, what we would call the timescape, uh, we are having all of those experiences. And at some point, I think, in um, the evolution of our consciousness, or the evolution of our soul, we can pull back and, and see bigger pictures, uh, pieces of this picture. Yeah, okay. Well, I gotta tell you, Georgia, uh, between your two co-hosts here, you got like 80 years of combined experience. <laughs> we can't entirely say what you're dealing with here. Uh, but this goes on, uh, Rosemary here. Also, the trick with seeing ghosts is that the receptors on the side of the eye are more sensitive to a broader spectrum of light, while the central rods and cones only see the visible spectrum. What do you think of that? It's very characteristic that people will see things out of the sides of their eyes. Yeah. They'll notice motion, they'll notice form, and uh, skeptics say that that has to do with just the way the eye is engineered, but I do believe that's the case. And in fact, when, uh, when I teach people how to develop their psychic and intuitive powers, a lot of it, uh, some of the early exercises are about unfocusing your central vision so that uh, you're more aware of what's going on in your side vision. Yeah. No, I, I tend to agree with that, too. And uh, she goes on here, that, that is why when you look directly at them, they disappear. Now that we've all had that happen to us. Oh, very much so. Yeah. And, uh, um, Rosemary, before we burn up this hour, which we're doing, this is the quickest hour I can remember in a while, please tell us about about yourself, your, your own website, your own many, many books. You've written a lot more than I have. And uh, just so people will know... Um, where they can find out more about you. My main website is visionaryliving.com. I have a newsletter, a lot of articles about my um, close to 60 books out now. And, and oh, the top, you make me sick. Angels, the zombies, and everything in between. Yeah. I walk both sides of the fence, the light side and the dark side. 
And I have another website called jinnuniverse.com, D-J-I-N-N Universe, uh, about the little-known jinn. And uh, I, I thank you very much for your comments on the Jinn Connection, my new book. Uh, it is really going well. People are responding to it. It's a great book. I, I know that I have touched on something that is very important to our knowledge of the multiverse. Yeah. Well, Rosemary is a legend in the, in the paranormal community, and we're always proud to have her with us. Um, okay, so, yeah, we know about the peripheral vision. Uh, here, And uh, Georgia goes on, but if you can remember to look at them sideways, you can keep them in your vision. All right. I'm glad you mentioned parasites, as that is something many people need to learn about. They can be very frustrating. Well, I can think of a few other words, too, but I like most of what you say. And, again, for those who don't know, those are... That's kind of a term. It's not just Ben and I using that term. A lot of people use them. They're entities that sort of feed off of negative human energy, for lack of, of any better way to explain it. And we run into those all the time. And they are, in my opinion, responsible for our legends uh, of not only demons, but even of vampires. Because the ancient Babylonians and other ancient peoples would refer to life-sucking ghosts. That's literally how it's translated. And that, that's what these things do. I don't think they're, personally, I don't think most of them are spirits. They're about nine different species. They seem to be just multidimensional beings who can kind of reach into several worlds at once, we found them doing from time to time. But anyway, uh, I recently discovered your show. I'm catching up on episodes. It is re- good luck. Hope you have a lot of time. It is refreshing to actually hear someone who knows their stuff. Too many presenting themselves as experts are not. And that's the end of the email. Um, Okay, well, very interesting. Uh, any, any further comments, Rosemary, before we go to the next one? Because this is a very good email, I think. Very interesting. There's a lot in it. There are many entities who are vampiric. They will suck your life force. They will uh, take uh, the luck out of your life. Uh, in vampire folklore, they take the beauty right off your face. Yeah, there are oh, yeah. lot of parasitic entities. Yeah, well put. And we run into them all the time. And as Rosemary has pointed out, they often will mimic... It's strange because they are part of nature, and many things in nature will mimic other creatures in order to either prey or prevent from becoming prey, and uh, really quite it's the same thing here. One, before we leave this, there's another sort of interesting thing here that, that someone, in fact, a physicist pointed this out to me, a physicist who might, might agree more with the classical interpretation of this. Uh, he said, don't forget the notion of non-locality. And in physics, non-locality, well, in our case, anyway, non-locality means that your memory, your imagination, and all this kind of thing isn't necessarily inside your brain or inside your body. And if it is non-local, uh, I suppose we're talking in the sense of uh, Dr. Carl Jung with his notion of uh, the collective unconscious, it's something outside us that can be tapped into for instinct and memory and things of this kind, then uh, it might be very possible for someone to be a quote-unquote spirit, to be outside the body, and still have access to all this information. So that's something I have to think about myself, you know, but uh, it's, it's, it was a good point. Okay, so we're moving on here to, um, uh, let's see, this is from Carl H. in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we always love our Australian listeners. We seem to have quite a few of them. Uh, NPR is... Quality is right. Well, that's nice. Thank you. I have never heard a more articulate presentation on the paranormal. In the first show of yours that I discovered, you mentioned people feeling that they didn't belong here. After years of thinking that I was just a little crazy and fearing for my important professional position, if I went over the edge, you boys have reassured me that maybe I'm not crazy after all. I have often felt that I don't really belong on this planet or even in this species, and your multiverse theories explain why. Well, I don't know, maybe. But do you think there could be more to it than that? If it, it, is it possible that the ancient alien pushers are right? Could someone have messed around with our genetics then just left us here? Well, that's fraught with uh, all kinds of interesting ideas, too. Um, do you run into people, Rosemary, who think they don't belong here? Or do you yourself ever feel that way? I think some of us lately always do, but... I I have felt that way my whole life, Paul, and I think many people in this field who go into metaphysics and the paranormal do so because they have that intrinsic feeling that they are not from here. I do believe that I've had many incarnations on Earth, but that I originated somewhere else. Where, I don't know. I've tried to explore it in uh, under traditional past and what I would now call parallel life regression, and I haven't yet been able to find anything concrete but there are plenty of us on the planet 
who do feel that way. And, in fact, Scott Mandelker wrote a very interesting book some years ago called From Elsewhen, where he talks about people who feel displaced on Earth. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I invented that term. Oh, well. Uh, pardon me? I thought I, I thought I coined that term. Oh, well, I guess. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. It's probably out there in the great sargasso sea of ideas. Out in the collective unconscious, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I also agree that we've had a lot of genetic monkeying around. Yeah. Well, you know what really got me thinking was, was when I was researching my last book, Turning Home, uh, there was um, the, the Human Genome Project had just been completed. And they found 223 genes that shouldn't be there if evolution as we understand it is correct. And, and they were postulating some sort of, what were the, I believe the quote was, parallel transfer from bacteria, whatever on earth that could be. So it, to me, that just didn't do it. But the, the whole idea of, of us being different is, is kind of strange. We had one guest who pointed out that we are not well adapted to this planet which does not bode well for our past evolution. It's as if someone did mess with us. We're standing on all fours. Our stomachs and, and, and our, our genitals are exposed, and they shouldn't be. We should be on all fours. You know, we stand on, on two legs uh, very, very uh, uncharacteristically uh, with, with, uh, with terrestrial life. There, there are things that are involving um, simply the fact we don't have any fur to protect us from the elements. We have to make clothes and live in very complex houses and environments that we create ourselves. And, uh, you know, it does kind of make you wonder. It doesn't seem as though we are the, the product of evolution as it is generally understood. It, it, we are the most disadvantaged species on the planet. Yeah, seem, seemingly, and uh, certainly uh, at our own hands half the time, too. So uh, I think that there might be a point here about that. Um, I don't know. I, I suppose I've, I've really never fit in either, which is probably why I'm doing this. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, yeah, even in the seminary, man, I was thrown out, thrown out for being involved, you know, in the paranormal research. They didn't like that and all this business. So all of us have our stories and our sagas, but, uh, there are many people, many, many people who come to us or write to us or will come up after a talk or something and say, you know, we just, I just don't feel like I belong here. And I suppose with the understanding of you have many, many lives, uh, li- you're, you're living, and it's all really part of you. It's, I, I sort of think of it as one big life uh, in a sort of very elegant kind of uh, super biosphere, uh, then you would have feelings like that, depending on what you're in touch with. Uh, when, I, when I was dealing with that, that little five-year-old boy who was terminally ill back in the 90s, and he told me about the, the high men and the low men, or the high people and the low people, it was... A, very telling because he he really explained in some simple words what I'd always suspected that if you're in touch with the best part of yourself the I suppose what what they might call the higher selves and this kind of thing these are all you in you parallel worlds where things are different and you are wiser or more knowledgeable or less fearful or something like that if you're in touch with that best part of yourself you tend to be a high person one who is not preying upon others. And if you are in touch with the worlds where you might be sort of a parasitical kind of entity or whatever, you might be uh, doing some serious things to, uh, to harm your own life here. So I don't, these, are, these are all, it's, it's the first day of school here, but I think that this, this really does touch on something. Uh, but the notion of genetics, well, it's, it's, it is pretty strange. Uh, we've we've um, always wanted to have uh, Eric Von Daniken on the show. He uh, has never been able to quite coordinate his schedule, plus he's in Europe, which is crazy time difference. But uh, I don't know, uh, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Rosemary, the, the whole idea of, um, I don't know, us not really fitting in here, as, as you say? I, I do believe that other beings probably seeded us on this planet, and we may have been tinkered with by m- multiple races of entities who have visited yeah. us in the past. This makes much more sense to me than the biblical story of um, creation from God. I believe in a divine being. I believe in a supreme intelligence and um, a power that holds everything together. But the way we've evolved and our old mythologies about all of these visitors, uh, strange visitors with uh, enormous superpowers and who come and teach us things, and sometimes for better or for worse, um, this to me indicates some sort of genetic tampering, which seems to be still going on in, uh, as we see in the ET abduction phenomenon. Mm. 
Kind of looks like that, yeah. uh, We've had an entire history of uh, sexual interaction with all kinds of beings, demons, angels, fairies, the jinn. And where are all these hybrids? Do they all go to other dimensions? Are they still on the planet? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. As a matter of fact, I was just talking with someone the other day that the, the, the newest trend in UFO research is to uh, sort of uh, harmonize, or if you can even call it that, or at least connect with other areas of the paranormal to enhance understanding of the UFO phenomenon. And, and you see so many parallels between the UFO abduction phenomenon, and we, you and I have talked about this before, uh, and, and the fairy thing and all these things, it just it seems the only difference in, at times seems to be the terms that we use. Well, exactly. So I think we need to reevaluate a lot of our outlook on ancient aliens, our mythologies, our, our own creation stories. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm open to the idea that we have been part of a genetic evolutionary thing. And in some cases, uh, you know, when I get pessimistic, I say, well, you know, <laughs> they didn't do some, some of these things so well. I mean, look how violent we've been throughout our history. Yeah, so, yeah they messed it up. Away. It just seems to go from one, diff- one form to another different form. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, what do we got there, Mr. Producer? Oh. Uh, oh, okay. We're, we're, we're not dead yet. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, that that would be interesting. Okay, well, certainly uh, there's the notion, too, that, that I, I suspect at times that we may have, might have done this to ourselves in, in a funny way. Uh, in turning home, I point out that uh, I know I was in touch with some archaeologists who did some work on this, particularly at uh, Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan, which is a very, very interesting ancient city that appears to have been, for lack of a better term, vaporized. And we're talking, you know, many, many, many thousands, you know, not many, 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 but many, many thousands of years ago. And the uh, it was one of the most important cities of the Indus Valley, uh, one of the, fount- the, the fountainheads of, of the great Indian civilization that we have today. And this, uh, the, there was an entire circle around the center of the city, uh, maybe the fire department heard me there, around the center of the city where the sand was heat fused into greenish glass and if you go down to new mexico to uh, places where uh, nuclear bombs were first invented and tested that's what you find sand heat fused into greenish glass so uh, i i wonder if if um, through some uh, one of these disappearing uh, acts that we talked about earlier in the show and multiversal time you know time slips space slips whatever that some people didn't um, manifest back in those days and they might have been us in, in one form or another and doing all these weird experiments and bringing the uh, blessings of nuclear energy to the ancient world, but who knows? Uh, there is some evidence, and I know Rosemary can back me up on this, there's some evidence that, uh, particularly from the uh, southwestern native uh, folklore, that this we've gone from, as it were, uh, stone tools to power tools at least four times in our past history. And uh, we may be coming to another such juncture, and I don't know if you... Agree with that or not, Mary, uh, Rosemary? But the picture doesn't look very well for the future in terms of our ability to sustain this high-tech lifestyle and yeah. the consumption of the resources. And it would not surprise me if, at some time in the not too distant future, uh, we wind up uh, hurtling ourselves back into a very primitive state of existence and living yeah. if we manage to make it there at all. Well, on that cheerful note, we're just about out of time. So <laughs> hopefully uh, have a more um, uh, people want to bad dreams tonight. So, again, if, you're, if that didn't scare you, uh, you'd probably be scared enough to listen to the uh, city council meeting right after our show tonight. I don't know if that's any scarier than the uh, Bruins Maple Leafs game last week. They're following us, but uh, take your, take your, uh, pick your poison. Anyway, I want to thank... Uh, our wonderful guest host and our good friend Rosemary Ellen Guiley and our producer Steve Bianchi. And next week being Memorial Day, we will do a rebroadcast, but we'll be back live in two weeks on June 3rd with parapsychologist Lloyd Orbach and a discussion of paranormal TV and the paranormal community. And on the CBS radio edition of the show on Sunday, May 26th, Paul and Ben will do another open line show. Always love those open lines, Paul. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The well, you contributed to this one. Second, uh, their guest will be Dr. Jesse Marcel, Jr., son of the chief protagonist in the Roswell UFO case of 1947. That's going to be another great show. That'll be great. He's never been on before, and uh, can't wait to can't wait to talk to him. It should be terrific. 
Uh, okay, we will, uh, maybe we got another, well, we got a little bit of time, but we leave you this evening with a quote from the great English poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Earth's crammed with heaven, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. Uh, I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Rosemary Ellen Guiley, sitting in for Ben Eno. Thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. See you next time. Well, you got a whole time. We got a whole, but we, we there, well, it's not quite next time yet. Well, Rosemary, we missed time that one, but what the hey. All right. I wanted to just tell everybody locally here that, uh, I was very, very, um, pleased to be at the uh, groundbreaking for the house in Burlville, Rhode Island, our listening area for Lieutenant Kevin Dubois and his wife. Uh, the house is being donated by the local builders association and homes for our troops. And it was a very inspiring event. There were many, many people. As a matter of fact, his commander, from uh, Afghanistan, when he uh, he lost both his legs there, uh, was in uh, Newport, uh, Rhode Island, here at the Naval War College, and happened to hear about it. And was able to come to this. It was just a tremendous event. And we ask you to, to support Builders Helping Heroes and Homes for Our Troops. Check out BuildersHelpingHeroes.org. It's a great great organization. Okay, so I guess we're we are just about done. Again, Rosemary, thank you for a wonderful show. And uh, I'm trying to find out more about these cases we talked about. There's some real uh, real barn burners in there. We'll see what we can we can find out uh, find out about that. So again, uh, check out Rosemary Allen Guiley's site. Uh, what is your site again, Rosemary? VisionaryLiving.com. VisionaryLiving.com. Com. And her many many books as well, especially the Gin Connection, the newest one. We'll talk to you next week, folks. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.